the new model. Okay. So we're going to close the smoking and heart disease model. May come back to it at some point um, to elaborate it in a couple interesting ways. But for now, we're going to start with a blank slate. And we are going to build up a, um, a simple uh, model of network-based spread of uh, a pathogen. Um, but if you want, you could think of it as spread of ideas or innovation or what have you. So we'll do file new model. And we will call this um, uh, SIRS um, uh, network um, model uh, version one. And uh, the model time units here will be days, okay? Um, so one unit of time. So one, one in terms of time will mean one day not one year like the um, the previous model with which we were working, okay? So I did file new, uh, I named it SRS network model V1, and I chose the time unit to be days. Okay, now building that up, um, what we see here is, I'm gonna get this over here. Uh, what we see here is a, uh, uh, structure of the model, which involves just this overall environment, this main, and then an initial experiment. So we have to fill in the rest. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is to put in place a person. We're, we need a theory of personhood. We need a theory of what it means to be a person for this model. And to do that, uh, we'll right-click on this model and we'll say new agent type and we'll say person uh, with a capital P and finish here. How did I do that? I went right clicked here. I said new agent type and I did person and I said finish. Okay. okay. So there we go. Now, uh, having done that, we now have a kind of vacuous theory of pers personhood. There's, we do have a theory of person that's currently empty and we want to populate it. And one of the first things you want to do, this is kind of a, a little, um, a little silly detail, but in any logic, if you're building this up, you want to Im immediately um, put any mechanism to, for visual representation of the agent. This time, before we had used, um, under presentation, we had used a, an oval. This time we're gonna use, pursuant to a question from one of the participants in the room, we're gonna use a person um, icon, an anthropomorphic icon. It's down here in this area called pictures, and you can drag in a person, okay? Um, this afternoon, you'll be encountering this afternoon or probably tomorrow, you'll be encountering some of these other, uh, uh, these other icons, such as the truck icon, the lorry. Okay, so we dragged it in and here we have an image of a person, okay? This one actually is a little bit more, a little bit more uh, texture to it. In the previous one, it's a little bit more, um, tricky to deal with, but we'll navigate it. Um, okay, so here we have this icon for a person, and we are going to go and create a, a group of these people in the model. And you're gonna tell me what that group is and where it goes in the model. So where? Do, so if I wanna have a collection of people in the model that are changing over time, just like we had in the previous model, where does that live in the model? It lives in Maine, exactly. Yes, it lives in the overall environment. It lives in uh, lives in, in Maine. So we double click on Maine. And one of the most important things to, to just keep track of 
um, to avoid rookie mistakes is when you're interacting with the model, be aware where you're interacting at. Are you a main? Are you looking at person? One of the most classic mistakes beginners make, and in my more somnolent, um, soporific moments I've done it in one or two boot camps, is I'll put something in a main that I meant to put in person. Um, so don't 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 go down that road. Um, uh, so um, you want to be keep track where you are. We're going to be in Maine, and we want to create. So it, it's going to live in Maine. And and what is this thing called? This collection of people, this grouping of people. It's called a what? Population. Population. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay. So how do we create a population? Anyone remember? You saw me starting to do it there, and then I said, I should ask you, how do we create a population? Anyone remember? We click on person, we drag it in. There we go. Ready? So I clicked over here on person and dragged, and I let it go. And then I will call it population. Now, if you forgot to do that or you misspelled it like me, you could go to the properties window and you could say ION like this, population. Now, is that a population yet? No, what do we have to do? We have to say it's a population of agents. And you know where I'm going with this, don't you? Um, uh, for, for the first little bit here, um, because we're rehearsing earlier skills. Charles Atlas, uh, former Miss, Miss the Universe or that, I don't know. Um, he said, he was asked, how do you build such big muscles? And he said, I started with 64 pound weakling muscles, um, muscles like mine, I guess. Uh, so um, he, um, um, he started out, he, he had to exercise those muscles. We're going to have to exercise these mental muscles, okay? So we have a population of agents, it's 100 agents. And if we ran the model now, what would we see? Who could say? We did it yesterday. We did it, sorry, Monday, or Monday. What will we see? Yeah, there'll be 100, but will they, uh, what would they look like visually? So yeah, they'll be on top of each other. I, then I made the comment stack like cordwood, right? So if you right click on simulation, you do run, th there'll be a hundred people that appear there. Um, they just happen to be on top of one another. How do we know there's a hundred here? Because it says a hundred here. If you, if you click on that, it's a hundred. Look, they're there. Or you can go over here to the developer panel and you could pull it down. You could say a hundred. Here's person zero, mm -mm. person one, mm -mm. person two, mm -mm. Um, not a lot of heterogeneity there. Um, they all look the same. Okay, so let's distribute them. Now on Monday, I told you to go down to networks and, and uh, we can set there for them to be distributed uniformly around. And we still could do that. If we went to main and we could go to network, oh, sorry, go to space and networks and we could set it to be a layout type random. But I'm gonna tell you another way that's more general to do that because we're growing, growing our strengths here. And I'm gonna be expanding your repertoire. Okay, um, so ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to go to the population. There we go. And I'd like you to go in the population to initial location. Mm. Mm. Oh, this would be fun. Yeah, why don't we do this? Oh, that would be fun. Okay. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the initial location, I'd like you to, you could see it says place agent in the initial agent uh, animation location, the specified point, and I'm going to say in the specified point, okay? And um, I'd like you to now put in a formula here uh, for uh, the initial location, okay? Um, and specifically, uh, I'd like you to put in uh, a uh, for the X location, I'm going to give you a rule to determine their X location. I'm going to give you a bit of uh, a formula for it, okay? Um, 
it's going to be drawing it from a uniform distribution. Uniform between 0, 0.0. That will be the upper left in the x direction. And we're going to have it be between that, their x location be between that and the, the so-called space width, the width of the space. Okay? And you can say here space width, okay? And it's actually something you call. This is this is saying, hey, tell me the space width. And the begin paren and end paren are because it's a function. It's, it's saying, hey, give it to me. Remember in high school, you may have written down like sine of 30 degrees, right? Um, and you put it in parentheses to indicate it's the information sign needs to do its job. Oh, this is a leaky pen. Um, uh, so, so this is the information in the parentheses sign needs to do its job. It's a so-called argument. And that's what we use in, in Java when we call something. We saw it yesterday when we called the statistics we created. So space width just doesn't need any information to do its job. So you just call it with begin, paren, end paren. This is a call to uniform, asking, hey, uniform, give me a number between 0, 0, 0 and whatever space width for charts. Hmm? So space width, it's first going to call space width. It's going to get back a number. Maybe it's 100, 100.0. And then it's going to call, hey, give me an, a, a, a value uniformly distributed between 0 and whatever this return, 100.0. And it's going to get back the value for x. Are we OK with that? There are objections. Um, I will continue on. OK. Um, and I'm going to do basically the same thing for y. But instead of space width, I will make it space, guess what? Height. There we go. Like. So um, let's run the model now. What do you think we'll expect to see now? Well, make sure it builds. Make sure, make sure it builds here. Here we go. Okay, it's a happy camper. Now I'd like you to run it. Okay. What do you think we'll see? Anyone? Fading. Yeah, well, 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 we'll see see what people spread out, right? There we go. Are we okay with that? Okay. Um, okay, now. Great question. I'll show you how to change the color. Um, I, I welcome questions like that. So if we, so, so this icon, where does that live in the model? Where does, like, it's showing it right now in Maine, but where does it actually live? Person. It's in person. person. It's a person. We put it in person. So if you go, you have to go to person, and you have to select that. And you'll notice that there's some information on it that, in this case, is not going to be that helpful. Like, it's this scale and some... There's some things if you click on it, which is pretty cool that we may get to at some point, but it actually doesn't give you what you want. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you how to change its color. Okay. So what do you actually have to do? This has to do with when I said it's a little bit more of a pain to deal with. Go to expand here. You can expand here on this. This is a hierarchical menu. Um so for person, we can expand it using this little this little mechanism here. I think it may be called an expando, um, uh, technically. And and then we're going to do the same thing for presentation. Mm -hmm. And and you'll notice that this is this it has some information on the group, and you expand person, and there's something called shape body, which you know sounds like some sort of I don't know, some sort of like spa treatment um 
but uh, it's called shape shape body theory. Okay, um, uh, and uh, that's um, that's a noun. It's not a command. Um, and uh, if you go to appearance, there's there's this thing that says line color. And if if you if you want to uh, change its color, you could do so through here with fill color. So, for example, I could make its color, um, could make its color bright red, for now. Now we're going to actually come back to this and see it, but um, this will actually change them, and we could run them now, and it will be red. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, there you go. Now they're. Now they're uh, they're red. Okay. Okay. So we'll 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 come back to that. That's a bit of learning. Okay. Next, um, I am going to go and we we will put in place a uh, characteristic of each person, which will be their income. Okay. Kind of innovating on the fly here, but um, in a good direction that I think may speak to some of the interests in the group. I'm going to go to person and I'm going to add an income to them. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to give them a characteristic that's their income. Um, okay. And. Uh, this is going to uh, have a uh, have a default uh, value for their income, um, which will be a uh, thousand unless we uh, specify it. But we will be specifying that. Okay, so everyone is going to have an income right now. Okay, the default value is just if you don't specify it when you create them, what will their income be? And I'm going to make it a thousand, a thousand dollars per. Yeah, maybe maybe we'll make it ten thousand dollars a year. Okay, there we go. Ten thousand dollars a year. Okay. Is it going to be double or right? It's a double. Um, it we we could make it an imp, but it'll be easiest for our purposes if it's a, if it's a double, because uh, it can be fractional. Uh, We'll allow it to be include dollars and cents. Okay, so each person has an income. Um, now, when we have a parameter in person, remember that parameters encode assumptions. In this case, it's encoding an assumption about the person, their income. But it also serves a different purpose. It communicates that assumption from where that element of the model is created to to that element of the model. So for, for main, if you have a parameter in main, it's specified, the value of that parameter is specified in the, does anyone remember? If we have a parameter main, where is the value specified? In the, begins with S, ends with O. It is an N. Second letter is C. It's third letter is E. <laughs> Fourth letter is N. Scenario, thank you. I, I'll tell you a story. Um, long before most people in this room walked the earth, long before they were speck in the cosmic eye, I took my first computer program course. Um, I was eight years old, and uh, it was the mid 1970s. That's my age. Um, and uh, I heard there was going to be a computer programming course taught in town at an extension program run by the high school. How oh, wow, exciting. I wanted to learn computer programming. So I've been programming a calculator at summer camp. Um, yeah, I wasn't the normal kid at summer camp. And, uh, and I, I was really interested in encountering real computers. So we went down to sign me up for this camp. And um, uh, I remember going into the high school with my mother and I saw saw things that scared me. I saw like a bunch of figures um, 
uh, who seems uh, somewhat a gendered group, crouching over like metal and welding. And I saw all these sparks coming out and I thought, oh, this is the place where the big boys go. Like, I gotta be really careful here. So anyway, we went in and we signed me up for this computer course. And the first day of the computer course I went, it was like heaven. It's like, there were all these computers there. Some of them were teletype machines where they had like the paper coming out. Um, and it would, it would make, make those sort of sounds uh, while it was printing out and there was keyboard on it. And then there were some that were terminals and it, it was just awesome. So I, I, I was so happy in this room. Um, but everyone else was like, the minimum was at least like three times my age. That was like the youngest person in the class. And the, the, the instructor, I mean, he looked like he was 900 years old to me, probably, probably was about 60. Um, but uh, uh, he, he, um, he, he was an, uh, an older instructor and he thought like, wow, hey, you're old kid here, like, what's he doing there? Anyway, so I was in this course and we were doing work on the computers and so on. And he, um, um, he at some point, told us, we were going through some exercises, and he told us, we're going to have an exam. Well, what's that? You know, uh, uh, I knew exams were like serious things that big kids had to take, and I, I didn't know what, what would happen. So he um, he told me there was an exam, um, and it, it told the class. And he said, but don't, don't worry, we're going to have a review session for the exam. Okay, Jim. Oh. I'll, I'll be able to learn from the review session. So I remember sitting in rows and there were like 20 people around me, 25, all many times my age, at least three times my age, many of them, you know, five times my age or whatever, six times my age. Um, and they were all sitting around me. And this instructor was going over questions that might be on the exam. And he was, uh, uh, he was asking questions of the class while walking up and down through these rows. And was was asking us type of thing that might be on the exam and correcting people's answers and so on. And he had a style which um, um, was a bit unnerving to me because he kind of walked by someone and asked the person right next to him, kind of looked down at them and, and asked them this question. So all all went well for a while until he walked in. He looked. He came and he asked me and he said, "Suppose I wanted." So print out the numbers from one to 100. What would I use to do that in this computer program? So how would I get it to print out numbers from one to 100? What statement would be useful for doing it? Now it's just frozen. This, this you know, 900 year old guy was like staring down at me. And I, I didn't know what to say. And you know, I was on the spot. I just froze up. I didn't say anything. He said, he said, I'll give you a hint. It is an L, two O's, and a P. I said, cool. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's all I remember. I, I suspect the whole class loved it. Um, but um, that was my start in computer programming. And if I could come here, so can you, okay? Um, so, cool, I'll say it again. Okay, so um, uh, we have income 10,000, let's go. And if we run the model now, we will see these individuals in the population each be bequeathed with an income, right? Um, what would the income be for each of them? Anyone want to say? I'll come back to the point I was making. It'll be 10,000, right? Uh, so here's person one, and there's their income of 10,000. Here's person two, or, or the second person in the population, 10,000. So what I was saying before my story was that um, for each element of the model, um, if we have a parameter in that element, there's... there's uh, the, the point where that element is created needs to tell us what to assume for that parameter. Otherwise, we'll use the default value. So I set a default value of 10,000 um, for this one. Now, if a parameter is in main, 
the default, the value for that parameter is set where main is created, which is the Y. I'll give you a hint. It is S C E. <laughs> <And, laughs> okay, good. Um, the scenario tells parameters in main what to assume. Scenario is responsible for creating main and telling what to assume for parameters. That's why when we want to make alternative scenarios, we specify parameter values there. Do you remember that? We can say big population, small population, that sort of thing. If a parameter is in person, its value needs to be specified by the thing that creates person, which in this case is the population. Well, later come when we create persons dynamically, when we create them like for birth, we'll come to how we do that. But here it's the population. So the population here specifies the value of this parameter. And you notice this value is specified there because it was our default. But we'll instead draw this from a value. And specifically, we're going to draw it from log normal distribution with a log mean of six and a log standard deviation of two. In other words, the mu will be six, the sigma will be two for the whom that's meaningful, and zero will be its minimum value. Okay. Um, uh, Wade, could you uh, talk with the tech staff about this this screen blinking? Yeah, that'll be great. Um, okay. Um, okay. So now we're going to draw the value of each person's income from this distribution. We'll run it. And do you think everyone will have the same um, same income right now? Okay, specifically, if we go look at the develop, developer panel and we scroll here, here's person zero in the population, now with an income of $9,000 a year. The next person will be 40, uh, that's, that person is rather, rather um, low income, $178 uh, per year, et cetera. Okay, um, so now we're drawing people from a distribution. Now, what we're going to do now is um, we are going to set their X location to indicate their income, okay? And do you remember where people's X location was specified? Does anyone remember where that was? Zero to space. Yeah, zero to space width. And where was that? Where did we write that? It was an attribute of the population. So if we go to population, that's right. Um, uh, yeah, so it's going off a couple times an hour, it looks like, um, for like a second. Do Greg is aware of this from previous years, um, but I want him to know it's still occurring. Yeah. All right. I'll, uh, okay, thanks a ton. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, in, oh, oh, you mean so like zoom in? Yes. You bet. Um, so something like this. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll go and recenter it. But uh, something like that. Okay. Um. Yeah. So for the population. For X here, we're going to make it income. So in other words, the person's income, okay? Um, okay. So we're gonna have their X location be driven by their income. We are now going to run the model and what do you think? Oh, it, it 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 had a problem. Okay, income. Sorry, I'm sorry. Oh gosh, what a rookie mistake. Self dot income. Self dot income. Self is the name of the person being created. It's one of these rare things in any logic that's used in certain contexts. Here, the person isn't yet created. They're not yet created within the population. This is giving the recipe. When I create a person. Um, 
set their X location by being the income for that person, which has already been set up, specified up here. They're going to have this income, and their X location will be that income for that person, and their Y location will be given by this. Okay. And, and we will need to build. Okay, if you run uh, TAs, um, be prepared for dealing with student needs here. Okay, so who are the folks out here to the right? As you go, you go um, to the right here. Who are those folks? Can anyone say? Higher income. Higher income individuals. So as we go out here, these are individuals who are higher and higher incomes. That's right. Okay. Um, good. Now, we want to make this model a little bit more flexible with respect to some of the most basic assumptions. Right now, what is the population of this model? Does anyone remember? It's hard coded as a hundred. We wanna make it based on a population size. Let's exercise those muscles. So from the palette, we're going to add a parameter as we did yesterday and the day before that was a population size parameter. Actually, I think we only did it once. Okay, yeah, we only did it yesterday. Okay. so. Drag in a, a parameter will be called population size. And what type will it be? It's a count of people. So it's a what? Integer. And by default, we'll make it 100. By default. Now, this says population size. Is that the population size yet? Is that going to be enforced as population size yet? Or is there another set way of the thing? What, what have I not done? I've said it's population size, but but is that, has the mechanism been put into place in this model yet that that in fact is the population size? No. Where do I have to specify, say, that is the population size? Where do I have to make that happen as a mechanism? Population. Yeah, go to the population. Exactly. And I need to set initial number of objects, and I need to give it, what should I put here? Population, population size. You got it. Okay. Now it's, it's honest to goodness population size. Okay. Great. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so, um, so we will now run this model. Um, we're going to create a um a different population size. So we're going to take this uh take this. We'll call it the base. So we'll call it small population population um 100 next we will put in place a new experiment we're going to put in place a new experiment excuse me by right clicking say new experiment and this will be called baseline and it's going to have a population size of of a uh, thousand. Okay, there we go. Baseline, and it's going to have a population size of a thousand. You know. Really, it's a best practice if the default values are the values used for baseline. So I'm going to go back to main, and I'm going to make the default value of population be 1,000. I'm sorry. It's just I like baseline to have default values where possible. 
it just lowers confusion, lowers risk of error of me creating a scenario with accidentally a different value. So I went back to Maine and as best practice, in accordance with best practice, I made its default value be a thousand. Okay. Okay. So let's run this. Let's let's build the model, and now let's run it. Uh, make sure it builds, and we're going to run it. So this is with a thousand, a population of size thousand. Great. Let's now close this. And now let's put into place a network. Okay. Does anyone remember where I put into place a network yesterday? Does anyone remember, anyone remember where I went to set up a network? Possible someone noticed it earlier because we actually went there briefly to talk about another way of laying laying people out in the in the diagram. Where 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 is that place that I set it up? Anyone? Sorry. Space. Yeah, space and network in the population. I'm sorry, in Maine, in Maine, not not the population. Space and network in the po in Maine. And I, I'm going to do a network type and I'm going to do distance based, okay? Um, now, right now I have a number here, but in general where any logic looks for numbers, you can instead put code. What you've been doing in entering uniform distribution or space width or log normal, all those are little bits of Java code, it turns out that are computing values in those cases. So here, I'm gonna make this connection range, in fact, a parameter value, okay? And it's gonna be called connection distance threshold. So I'm going to add it to the model in the palette. Connection, connection distance threshold. Where did I do this? I did it from the palette, I did it from the Agent area, the palette, the parameter, just like we did population size. So there's a thing called connection distance threshold. And I'm going to set its value to be by default 250. Okay. Okay. And I will go to main, back to main as a whole. And I will set the connection range to be given by, guess what? Anyone? Connection distance threshold. So what did I do? I know I took a number of steps here. The first thing I did was I added a parameter called connection distance threshold. I set its default value to be 250. And, and I'm going to be a little bit picky and make it 250.0. I then went to main, excuse me, I went to main and I set it so that the network type is distance based and that the connection range is connection distance threshold. Now we're not quite done yet. If we ran it right now, people would be in a network but it wouldn't be obvious that they're in a network. There's one final thing that we need to do. We need to go to person and we need to set the network to be visible. The network for person is set with these connections for person, up above person. Each person can be in one or more or zero or more networks. If there's only one network, we use these built-in one connections. Otherwise we can add more network the ability to connect to more networks from the panel. These connections here are for the default network. And we're going to set it up so that they're linked to other persons. That's that agent type. 
in this network under person. I'm under person. I'm not under main right now. I'm looking at person. Make sure you're looking at person. I'm going to connection, set the agent type to be person. And I want to, for animation, do this draw line connecting agent. And there we go, Wade. Just blinked again. Yeah. Yeah. Could someone, uh, could one of the TAs keep track of the number of times, maybe the times at which it's blinking? I want evidence-based complaints that will give um, an evidence base behind our complaints. Okay, draw a line connecting agents in this network. Okay, I'd like you to build and I'd like you to run this. Okay. And here it's seeking to wire people up into networks. There's a lot of people connected to each other, particularly in this income over low income area to the left. So it's actually taking a while. There it is. Okay. That connection range is a little bit long. There's very, very dense connections. This person is probably connected to, I don't know, a couple dozen people. And who are these folks over here in this area? What characteristic do they share in common? Low income. They're low income individuals. You'll notice that they're, they have a different density associated with them compared to these folks over to the right. Um, and in fact, the further you go to the right, the um, the the lower the the density will be. You can see it here, right? Um, these folks do have connections, but some of them just a handful of connections. Okay, so we're gonna dial back that default value for the connection distance threshold. I'm gonna make its default value fifty here. Okay. Okay. There we go. Um, okay. Now let's let's go run this for the baseline. So I changed the default value of the connection distance threshold to be fifty, just to make it a little bit less overwhelming. And there we have something like this. Okay. Better, better, uh, a lot of disconnected components to the right. Um, and, you know, if it were a little bit longer, I might, uh, might not complain, but uh, I think I'll, I'll keep it, uh, keep it at, at 50 for now. Okay. So we have people who have different locations um, visually and they that location is dictated by their income and individuals over here on the left hand side are lower income can anyone comment on the level if if we were to analogize this to crowding who's more crowded lower income individuals or 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 higher income individuals. Lower. lower income individuals are a lot more crowded. And that's gonna make a big difference for where we're going. Okay, so we're going to put in place, so right now this model is heterogeneity, heterogeneity of location, heterogeneity of income, but it doesn't yet have dynamics. All right, we have this rich network structure, but there's no change in this model right now. It's static. It's a static network. Let's put into place dynamics. And one of the most common ways we capture dynamics in agent-based models, capture states, the actions that change those states, and the rules that govern those actions is by what construct? What, what were we working with yesterday? And what were we working with it was even the very first example on Monday morning? We were working with stuff that begins with S. State, state charts. Yeah, state charts. 
Sometimes it's called state diagrams. Okay, so we're going to build up a state chart for this. And it's going to be a familiar one, and it's going to be an SIRS one. So we're going to go to the palette, and probably I should go put, I should go save this model and post it. So if anyone's struggling and you want to get my model, you're welcome to do so, as always. And I will go to models built in class, and I'm going to upload our model here. Uh, and we are good to go. So it's up up there in models built in class. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen. Okay. So we're going to go to person and I am going to add a state chart. You're going to tell me, where do I go to add a state chart? I go, need to go to the what? Um, palette. And where in the palette? Maybe Aiden. Aiden. Good, good. Yeah, the Da Vinci logo. Good. And now I want to drag in what thing to start the, the state chart? What do I drag in? State chart, state chart entry point, you know. Remember, each state chart reflects some concern. We could have many state charts for a given person, maybe one for employment status, one for housing status, whether someone's housed, um, suffering, wait, another one? Yeah. Um, whether someone's facing transient uh, shelter challenges or, or chronic shelter challenges. Um, so for the state chart, we're going to um, call this one infection state chart, okay? It has to do with infection. There might be others we add for other, other things. If we are more specific, we might specify the pathogen. And indeed, a given model could have COVID-19 as one pathogen with one state chart, flu as another one, and RSV as another one. Uh, as three different state charts, for example. Okay, here we go. Uh, infection state chart, and we're going to add in a state here. Okay, and this one will be susceptible. And we're going to add in another state that will be infective. Do we have a latent state? Do you want to have a latent state? Who wants a latent state? Okay, latent state coming right up. Okay, so this one will be called exposed. There, you could call it latent if you want. Um, the traditional term for it in mathematical epidemiology is exposed, but I'll call it latent because that's a better descriptor for, for health scientists. Um, uh, you can assign an integration state instead of latency. That's true. Um, that's true. We could have uh, an asymptomatic pathway and a symptomatic pathway. Maybe, maybe we'll come back to that point. Um, right now, I'm going to have a latent state, and then I'm going to have an infective state where they're so latent, they're infected, but not yet infectious, not yet infective. I'll have an infective state, and I'll have a recovered state down here, okay? There we go. And I, I don't have to really worry too much about its spacing, but I'll futz with it a little bit, just to get something a little bit closer to uniform spacing, okay. Okay, hey, now we're going to capture, remember, structure drives behavior. It's, it's in the structure that a lot of our expertise that's captured in a model is captured. It's the structure that captures that expertise every bit as much as any parameters. Structure in different system science traditions is captured, different dynamic modeling traditions is captured in different ways. In SysMyMX, it's captured in the stock and flow structure and the auxiliary variables, et cetera, particularly with stocks and flows. 
with edge-based modeling, a lot of the structure is captured in state charts, but there's other elements captured in network connectivity. Uh, there's there's structure captured in kind of the protocols by which agents interact with one another and their response to messages from one another. We're going to be getting there. Um, and you can actually have uh, additional types of structure captured kind of um, with, with algorithms or rules within here. Within a discrete event simulation, we have structure captured in workflow. But in all cases, structure drives behavior, drives emergent behavior. So here, we've got to link up the structure. Um, system science is about holes greater than the sum of the parts. And uh, it's the interconnections that matter. And here, the interconnections for the state chart capture that structure. They're the verbs. The states are kind of the nouns, but are more passive. It's really the verbs, the changes between them that are a little bit more foundational. So here we go. We're going to have progression possible from susceptible to latent state. I think it blinked again, Wade. Yes, yeah, I saw that. Okay. So I think it's blinking like every 10 minutes or something, or maybe even five. We'll, we'll have to see. Okay, what what would, just thinking mechanistically, what would lead someone who's susceptible to become infected? Good, exposure. Exposure to pathogens. And in fact, for them to become latently infected, there actually needs to be transmission. There needs to be infection that actually occurs, right? So... Um, I'm going to call this infection. Um, you could call it exposure, particularly if there was a chance that it might not stick. And I may come back to that point that it might, it, they might not, in fact, be infected when exposed. We're going to draw another one um, from going from latent to infective. And this might be. Um, might be uh, called, what do you think? Um, uh, completing latency or becoming infective or, um, uh, yeah, uh, so anyone have a preference? Completing latency? Um, I don't, yeah, uh, becoming infective. Okay, we'll call it becoming infective okay that's good and whoa oh or, or I, I think i somehow i moved around here and then uh we're gonna have a link from infective to recovered and and we'll call that recovery Okay, and finally, since it's a SIRS model, we're going to have one back to susceptible. And we will draw it from here. Make sure it connects with green on both sides. That's a key need. If, it, if it's just off, but it's, it's not green, it won't actually be connected. It will cause big problems. So make sure it's connected. Okay. And I'd like you to, to connect this here. And there you go. Okay. And this this will be called um, waning immunity. And you notice it's not showing the names. That that was my bad. I should probably make it show name here. And and we should show names for all of them. Now you notice I'm glossing over a lot of details. Now, fair enough. I'm I'm going to show the names and and arrange these next to, okay, there we go. And there we go, there we go, okay.
Great. So we have this basic structure captured, but there's lots of things we're missing right now. But still, it can be useful just to make sure that things are working to kind of run it along the way and, and so on. Um, but I would argue if we run this, we won't really see much difference yet. Why not? Why won't we see much happening if we run this? Yeah, so so that's that's part of it. And, and we'll come back to that logic in a key way. So thank you. We haven't specified any also any visual outcome which would distinguish people who are in different states. And I'd like to do so. This again is familiar territory, but it will rehearse some of the skills you learned from yesterday. So how would we how would we set it so that someone's color indicated their status here? How could we do that? How did we do that yesterday? Anyone? We used a yeah, we used a color variable. Remember that? And its its spelling was perhaps the subject of some international dispute. Um, but we're gonna drag in a color variable. Oh no, not a collection. Collections are good, but they're not what we need right now. Collections will kind of group sets of things. But here I dragged in a variable. Its name was color, except, you know, I'll, it'll be acceptable if our, yeah, it blinked again, wait. Good. Thanks. Um, so it'll be color. Now, what type is this? What sort of information does this hold? If it holds a color, spelled in the manner of the American Imperium um, with C-O-L-O-R. So here, the type. So that is the type of information that this will hold. It At any one time, it holds a value. Its value as a variable will be changing over time. The value of a parameter doesn't change typically. It's a it's a constant. It, it, it gets a value, then it codes an assumption, and it stays. But a variable... The job of a variable is to change, to vary. Um, uh, a variable's job in life is to capture variable, to capture varying values that might be updated. We saw it yesterday with counts, count tallies for the number of people who have heart disease or have or who are never smokers or what have you, and those were changing over time. Here, this will change over time. Its initial value will be black. We want to be able to distinguish, if we've never written to it, we want that to be obvious. So we give it a value. This is a best practice in programming. We give it a value that is recognizably uh, problematic. We will, we will recognize it if it occurs and we'll recognize, oh, we've somehow forgot to change it. And so we give it a value of black. Now, each of these, susceptible, latent, infected, and recovered, we're going to assign a value for this variable. So I will propose, in the interest of time, that I will, I will make susceptible. By the way, I'm changing its color visually to this, but that doesn't really change its behavior when I'm running it. It's just, it's kind of nice if we can remind ourselves what color is what. So I'm gonna make this lime, the color, how can I how can I make the value of this color variable be lime? What could I write? Color, what do I type next? No, 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 it's good, good guessing. I appreciate this, but it's not God, it's equal, equal. And we say lime. Do we need a semicolon or not? Yeah. Yes, because it's like, do it, do it, buddy. You know, just get it done. Okay, great. It's a command. It's it's almost like an exclamation point. Like, do it, do it. Okay. Next, um, fill color. 
Uh, for Leighton, we will make, I don't know, maybe orange? Orange? Is there, is there an orange here? This is kind of like, it's something called Peru. Other colors. Um, can I make an orange? Like, where's you can it? type in, it's a golden color. You oh, you can, can type, type in. Constant. Oh, sorry, sorry. Orange. Or, orange. Oh. And if you spell it correctly, it should. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, that's that's kind of nifty. Okay. And so we need to set color equals what? Orange. And it's nice if we spell it correctly. <laughs> uh, Wade well, is polite. Um, okay. Um, for this one, we'll make it red. Uh, and color will be red. All these need semicolons because they're commands. And recovered will make will make gray, and the color will be gray with a A. Okay, there we go. Okay, great. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so um, if I run this, will I see any differences? If I run this, what will people be changing color? Okay, let let's try it and. Okay, I built it. It's a happy camper. If it's not a happy camper, you grab a TA, but you may be disappointed. It's red all the way down. What haven't we done? We, 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 haven't, we haven't actually effectuated it. We haven't made it happen. Just like before, we had this variable called, this parameter called population size, but we hadn't yet hitched it up to, in fact, be the population size. We hadn't actualized it. We hadn't made that, in fact, the actual pop, honest to goodness population size. Same, same here. So how do we change? This is related to Saab's question earlier. How do we change this color? You want it, You want to change this color? I'll tell you how to change this color. How, how do we do it? Anyone remember? How did we go and we changed this color in response to Saab's question? It involved a bit of frobbing. Where was that frobbing centered? Remember this thing? Yeah, we went to project and then we went to person and we expanded the presentation. You could see what I'm pointing out on the screen. And we went to level and we expanded person. This is the thing that's kind of a pain about this little image. Okay, so we went down to shape body and um, uh, Far from being a Jack Lalane marketing command, uh, this is a shape body as a um, noun, and fill color here is what we want. But you notice right now it's a color. What do we have to do to, to tell it it needs to be a variable? It's a good life lesson for any of that. What do we do? Does anyone remember? We saw this, we saw this yesterday, I think. Um, also for the oval. There's actually something we have to futz here. Anyone remember what it is? Dynamic value. Yeah, we have to pull this down and do dynamic value. Exactly. Exactly, Wanda. Okay. We have to say color. Why do I say color? What is this? What is this referring to? There. The variable. So whatever color the variable is, it'll make the color of this person. Okay, now do you think we'll see people change color? We will, indeed. Well spoken. Okay, um, so I'm gonna run it. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna build it first, make sure it's a happy camper, and now I'm gonna run it. And what's going on? They're all changing at the same time. Why would that be? Because we haven't assigned it. Yeah, we have we haven't 
So, so we've got the basic structure. We've got the basic natural history of infection, that basic progression. That's, that's, that's super important. That's actually the most important thing. But now we have to specify the particular values and the particular conditions. So I want to I want to think more beyond values here, and I want to I want to talk about mechanisms. Uh, we, we've specified sort of the the types of pathways. When I talk about mechanisms, I talk about pathways to effect. We're talking about pathways here from one thing to the next. Hmm. But if we want to talk about how someone gets from susceptible to infection, how does that happen? It happens because of what? Yeah, exposure. It happens because they're exposed to pathogens. And the way in which we capture this in any logic, the way in which I say, if I'm exposed to pathogen, I become infected, is through a mechanism by which agents can interact with each other, can expose each other to what's called a message. So the message is going to represent the bit of influence, quantized influence of me on you. It's going to be this way in which I discreetly sort of get you something. It'll be pathogen for this, but it could be a bit of information. It could be a rumor. It could be some wacko conspiracy theory. It could be some innovation. It could be some, you know, um, um, the result of social marketing, um, of encouraging, you know, engagement in, in healthy behavior. So the most common way to capture those in an engine-based model is with messages, okay? So we're gonna put in place for the first time what's called a message transition. So this transition is going to be a message transition. Oh, sorry, not a condition, a message transition. Are we okay with that? Okay, okay, next. So that's that's great. Now, if we run this model right now, what will we see? We'll, we'll see, when you say same, same as what? As originally or same as, well, I'm running this. Maybe a while before we have to wait. I'm gonna sit down. Um, so, 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 so why isn't this changing? Because no X is being sent. What's X? Message. message. Great. No messages are being sent. Why aren't any messages being sent? Because no one in the model is equipped when they're infectious to send messages. And no one is yet infected because they're all waiting for a message. Right? They're all waiting to be told, hey, get infected. No one's infected, so no one's sending messages. It's like the situation with smallpox in Saskatoon. No one has smallpox. Everyone is is can be infected, but the, we don't have, there's no smallpox circulating. There's no one with smallpox to transmit. So we'll come back to this, but let's let's get in place the Excuse me, the other bits of logic. So for these, I'm going to create parameters to encode the length of the other assumptions. It's good practice. Don't try to avoid hard coding. And in software engineering, we try to avoid um, what we call magic numbers, like numbers just stuck into the model opaquely. We forget where they are. We forget what values they have. If we want to change them, we change them in place. That's bad practice because... We might change them one time, forget we changed them, and we're running the model with totally different assumptions we're not aware of about those parameters, about, about those values. So it's better to put them in parameters. Now, if they're shared between all people, those parameters can live where? They can, if they're shared between all people, they don't have to live at the person level. Each person has a different income, so that is to live at the person level. I have my income, you have your income. Each person is a value for that parameter, right? But if 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 my average time infectious is the same as your average, if if they are 
Um, if we have the same average time of fact, uh, in fact, if we could place that in Maine. And for simplicity, we'll do that. There are models where we have people have really different immune status. And I, I have a different average time infectious than you do, in which case we would live in person. We, we decide each person separately because we have different levels of immunocompetence. But for now, we're going to assume that the same. We're going to go to palette, and we're going to go to parameter here, and we'll create a, a bunch of these. Okay, um, so there's going to be a um, uh, a parameter called uh, okay. I'll I'll do uh, immunity duration. Now, when I name things. Sometimes I give the unit in the name, like immunity duration in days. Um, uh, and it's it's a pretty good practice to do that. Now, in this case, the unit of the model is days. And so, you know, if you don't say, if, if you say it's three, and or if you say it's 300, it implies days. Um, but I think I'll say immunity duration in days. Um, it, it just makes it extra clear. When someone sees this model for the first time, they they go. It is people have different reasonable um, uh, different reasonable preferences for this. Um, and then maybe I'll have um, infection duration in days, something like that. Especially if your model sometimes it has some things that are more in the order of the year, some things that are more in the order of days. Being clear when you give a parameter value, whether you're speaking about one unit or another is often really helpful. Um, and, and then I'll have um, uh, latency period in days, okay? Um, uh, uh, or, or I could say, maybe I'll, to be, I'll say latency duration in days, just to be consistent. These are all doubles because they could all be partial values and maybe for the first of them immunity duration in days i will make it 45.0 that might be a, a shorter immunity period um maybe something like chlamydia you know it, it doesn't have persistent immunity as best i uh knew the literature from a decade ago um infection duration in days maybe i'll make it 10.0 and latent duration late really it should be latency i'm sorry it should be latency duration in days the duration of latency in days maybe we'll make it um this one's an interesting one maybe by default we'll make it um uh seven days okay fine i'm sorry First thing, immunity duration. Uh, for the immunity duration, I made it 45. For the infection duration, I made it 10. And latency for 7. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we're, we're getting close to getting done with this. Um, and now let's go back. So, by the way, it's it's... I'm trying to increasingly um, give some advice for best practices. Um, naming matters. Naming matters. How we name variables, parameters, scenarios, constructs in the model, state charts, states, it matters. Naming communicates. If we aren't, if we're careless in our naming, it doesn't communicate as effectively. Choosing names that communicate effectively can make your model more powerful. It can help. It can help in discussion with stakeholders. It can help people feel it's less opaque, that it that it's more transparent. And it can help you in reasoning about it. It can help you from making certain logical mistakes. And so being careful about names, even at the cost of having them be a bit longer, is I think worth it. Um, it 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 makes you clear about what you're dealing with and and avoids silly mistakes. So let's go back to person. Okay, we're getting a lot of the way through. We're 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 a lot of the way through with this model. Um, 
So do we need to specify some duration for infection for this one? Uh, wait, another one? Yeah. Do we need to specify uh, uh, some value for this? Uh, uh, for a duration, do we have to specify some duration for this? Yeah. Yeah. Mm, no. For, because for, for, this is set by a message. This is going to be set... Whenever a message comes in, we're going to respond to it. If we're in the susceptible state and a message comes in, we're going to respond to it. So we actually don't have a choice of how long it is that we spend in the state. It's however long it will be until a, a message comes in. So we, we're, we don't have to specify a duration here. Um, it's dictated by when a message comes in. It's called an asynchronous transition. It depends... If no one sends us a message, we'll just be sitting here till the cows come home. And that's why I was sitting, because I was waiting for the cows to come home. Um, remember that everyone was green and there was just sitting there, like bumps on a log? You remember that? Like rain bumps on a log? Just a few minutes ago, right? Um, that was because they were all waiting for a message. And we could have run it for the balance of the boot camp, and it, they wouldn't have changed color. So we don't specify a duration it's set by whenever the message comes in. So we don't have to worry about giving them parameter or how long it will be. It'll be whenever the message arrives. By contrast, with this one, the duration of latency, duration of infection, duration of, of immunity, all those we have to specify with parameters. Now, we have some choices, ladies and gentlemen. We have two, and, and this is a point of learning. At, at a nominal level, it's about any logic, but at a deeper level, it's, it's really about model formulation. This, this comes in with models, regardless of whether any logic repath, net logo, or what have you, in different forms. We have to decide what the assumption is about when people come over under. So maybe we have an average time to come over, but we need to decide on the distribution um, of time they spend in the state. And there are two primary choices for that distribution type. One is a timeout. And so here, a timeout would say that someone main dot, and we would say main dot latency, latent, C, duration, and days, and we can do that. That's going to be saying that someone is going to come over. They're going to transition from the, the susceptible state to the latent state in exactly a certain period of time. So... So if this is time that they've been susceptible, oh, sorry, that they've been in the latent state, time in latent state, time in individual then latent state, and this is the probability that they will transition. Does anyone have a, any of the TAs have a uh, red pen, a red marker, a red whiteboard marker, whiteboard suitable marker? Um, so for a timeout transition, there's, if someone comes into the late state, there's zero chance they will leave before the specified timeout, in this case, latency, duration, and date. And they will leave at exactly this, the given timeout. So technically this is what's called a, an impulse uh, distribution. Someone like Don Wan Jing from, from uh, engineering back, wow. <laughs> that is service, thank you. That is awesome. Jenna has a bag of many tricks um, and and so they will exactly, leave. for anyone who's from more technical STM background, this is an impulse distribution. It's a Dirac delta function. And basically it means 
um, there's a probability one you will leave in this exact amount of time. Okay. If you're not, if that doesn't speak to you, don't worry about it. Don't worry. It just means it, you will leave exactly at this time, exactly at the time given by latency duration and days. Okay. Now, that is one choice. We could have them, they come into latency and they will leave exactly at that time after entry. They'll go on to this infective state. It's a timeout. When that time passes, it's like an alarm clock goes off. That alarm clock went off, you're, you're out of there at exactly that time. Hmm? Makes sense. Um, the other possibility that is very common, these are like the two choices that normally, uh, that are most normal. It's a rate transition, and you have a certain probability per unit time of when you leave. And here, if we want it to be an average, that same average we would do, the rate is 1.0 divided by the latency duration in days. Oops, sorry. Main dot latency duration in days. So, so I'll, I'll spread this out here, but basically the, the rate is one over this. This guarantees that on average, you will leave in latency duration of days, but sometimes you may leave before, sometimes you, lose after, you leave after. And this is associated with what's called an exponential residence time in that state. Incidentally, this is nothing particularly unique to modeling. This is stochastic first The same issues come up in biostatistics, where you have you have exponential distributions of, of time associated with survival analysis or competing risks analysis, recurrent events analysis. It's the same mathematics. It's it's nothing. Model. No, it's not modeling weirdness. It's just uh, there's no kind of stochastic processes that come up in biostatistical analysis related to survival analysis. Same thing, but here you might leave earlier, you might leave later, but on average, you leave on this time. This is memoryless. No matter how long you've been there, you have the same little chance of leaving per unit time um, per day, uh, no matter how long you've been there. This is your chance of leaving per day. You have that chance of leaving on the first time, the second bit of time, but your probability of having, and I really should have, um, yeah, this is this is not quite uh, accurate. This is the probability that you'll remain in the state. Your probability of leaving uh, at that time here is going to be, um, uh, so this is, uh, okay, no, 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 that actually is correct. It's, I'm confusing the conditional probability of the, the it is it is this. the probability that you will leave at that time is is given so this is for this is for a rate transition so rate transition you um you have the same given that i've been in here now till now my chance of leaving the next day is is fixed um so this is for a rate transition and this is for a timeout transition in both cases, the average is the same. So this is for a timeout. Um, timeout. And uh, this uh, this is the this is the average value. So uh, average. Uh, this is the average value. The mean value of for the rate is is the same value. So you can either choose. If I want to say I have an average time in here, latent state of this value, latency duration, I can either phrase it as a rate transition, or I can phrase it as a timeout transition. And they have different implications. Timeout means I will not leave before, I will not leave after. I will leave at exactly this time. Exactly this time. Whereas a rate transition says, hey, I may leave earlier. Each day I have the same kick at the can, the same chance per day that I will I will leave. Um and uh and and you know I might leave in the first day, I might leave in the second day, I might leave in the third day, the fourth day, etc. But conditional on me having banked or till now, my chance of leaving the next day is the same. 
Um, uh, another way to say it, another distribution I could put out here that maybe will clarify this a little bit in a way you can, um, maybe I'll draw this one in black uh, to, to avoid overloading colors here, um, is, so this would be, um, uh, this would be uh, time in, latent state also, latent state. Um, and this is probability, I'm gonna draw here, instead of the probability of transitioning at this day, I'm gonna be probability I, uh, I will leave in next day uh, given Given um, uh, still being still being in the latent state, being in latent state. Given that I'm still here, what's my chance that I will leave in the next day? And here, um, one uh, the the uh, timeout transition will again be an impulse. I'll, I'll, there's no way I'll leave in the next day before this time. This, Let's be straight up. Okay, that's better. Um, whereas this one, uh, the rate transition, it's my probability of leaving the next day is always this this probability per day. If I'm still there each successive day, I have this probability per day of leaving. Um, whereas a rate transition or a timeout transition, I won't leave until exactly this time. So, so these are two choices. They are ubiquitous in um, biostatistics, dealing with stochastic processes when you're dealing with survival analysis in here. And you have to choose between them. So if I want to say the average time in latent state is given by this, I could phrase it as a rate. That means some people will recover earlier, some later. That's the important thing to understand. A rate transition means some people recover earlier, some people later but on average, they recover at this time. So the question is, do you wanna allow that variability? Or do you just wanna say, by God, by God, they were they leave at exactly this time. Mm -hmm. In which case, no one's gonna leave earlier, no one's gonna leave later. They leave exactly at that time. That's your choice here. Now, I'm actually obscuring a fundamental a fundamental flexibility you have further in agent-based modeling, and it's and also here. In agent-based modeling, you could pick the distribution of time that you spend in the state. I could draw it from any distribution. I could draw it from an alpha distribution. I could draw it from a gamma distribution. I could draw it from an Erlang. I could draw it from a uniform. I could actually use that and make it my time up. So I draw a value from there and I say, I'm going to leave in this amount of time. And another one, when they come in, they'll say, I'll leave in another. But the most common ones are either this time out with this average time, which says no one will leave before, no one after. It'll be exactly that time. Or, or you have a rate and it's memoryless. This one is, this, this memoryless one, doesn't matter how long you've been there, you have the same chance of leaving in the next little day, whereas this timeout, the timeout one is totally memory fault. It's like, I, I will only leave in the next day if I've been there exactly. And if the, that means I've been there exactly for this length of time. So you could choose between these things. Um, rate transitions are a little bit more common. So I'm gonna use a rate transition here. That mean, on average, I'm there for this length of time. Some people leave early, some people leave late. It actually draws it from an exponential distribution. It draws it from this distribution right here. Okay, anyway, that was a bit of a discourse for those who are more technically inclined. Let's, let's continue on. So for this one as well, we have to specify either a rate transition or a, or a timeout transition. Um, I'll make it a rate transition one divided by main dot duration of 
And what do I choose here? Oops, sorry. Um, uh, it'll be infection duration in days. There we go. And for this one, I'll do the same. So I'll do it with a rate transition, one divided by that. You may ask, why is it one divided by that is the rate? Well, it turns out the average is one over the rate and the rate is one over the average. So that's just a kind of mathematical fact that comes up in survival analysis all the time as well. This will be one divided by immunity duration in days. So basic choice when it comes to these transitions, if you have an average time and state, you can phrase it as a timeout. You leave it exactly that time and there'll be no variability. No one leaves early, no one leaves late. They leave exactly that time or you can specify as a rate. And some people leave earlier, some people leave later. The chance per day of leaving is the same no matter how long you've been. There. And if you're still there, you have the same chance of leaving in the next day. Okay. Um, Great. Okay, so there we go. So we have this we have this state chart all set up. Mm -mm. All set up. What happens if we run this now? Can anyone tell me? What will happen if we run this? Will anything happen? We ran the model now. All of the state chart is all established. Will anything happen? No. Why not? We haven't sent the message. Yes, no one is sick. No one's there to send the message. So, so everyone's going to be awaiting this message. What state are they in? They're all insusceptible because they're awaiting the message. It's like waiting for Godot. They're they're awaiting here. Okay. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, let us put in place the mechanism to send messages. That's the final bit. So, under what conditions? So, so this message reflects pathogen transmission. The transmission of pathogen from one person to the next. On what, who will expose them to that message? So susceptibles await this exposure to pathogen. Who's going to be sending, who's going to be transmitting this pathogen? Someone who is what? In the network. Good. In the network, but in what state? Infected. infected. Exactly. Infected. So we need infected people to expose others to infection. Are you ready for this? Hearing no objections, we'll go to palette and we will put in a transition here that will be a rate transition. If you're seeing the same pattern again and again, it is with good reason. Now, no, let me let me just do this. I did that through a little bit too quickly for my for my own good, for your good. So let me drag that in again. What I said is we need to, if we're infected, we need to expose people to messages. How do we do that? We're going to accomplish it by having, when they're in the state, a uh, transition is going to fire that won't take them out of the state. They won't actually leave the state, but it will periodically fire. How will I do that? I will drag over a transition here, and I will use it to go from this state to itself. There we go. You can see it here. And I'm going to make it a rate transition. It'll be firing, firing repeatedly. I'm going to call it exposure. I don't say transmission because maybe the person next to them won't be able to be, won't be able to be infected. But I'm going to call it exposure. They're exposing others. Maybe I'll call it exposing others, exposing others. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, 
and it'll be given by a rate. And it's gonna we're gonna need a contact rate, a certain number of 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 contacts they have predicted with with their neighbors in the network. But right now we don't have that variable yet. If that variable is shared between all people, where does it live? Main indeed. So remember, go back to main, and we're going to add in one parameter called contact rate. And contact rate is going to be, we'll say, one per day, OK? 1.0. It's not contrary. It's a per day amount. It's company per day, the contact rate. Okay. Okay. So we put into main a contact rate. We're getting very close now. Just a few small things left. Well, a few things left. Okay, so go back to person, and this will be this little thing. It's going to be going off at a rate of anyone want to say what will the rate be? Main dot contact rate. So periodically at this contact rate, one ton per day on average. It's memory. This it doesn't matter when the last one happened. Your chance per hour per minute. Per second, that it will happen again is the same. It's just going off at a rate, independent of how long it's been since the last time that it happened. And this contact rate. And then, and here we go. We want an action. I need to do something, I need to expose them to a message. I need to expose the passage, which is accomplished by message. So I'm going to say, send to random connected. You notice there's a thing called neighbor, but that's a spatial thing. That's to my neighbor in space. This is random connected. And by the way, if you start this and you start going down uh, each of these, you can reason about, you, you can get information about um, what it means. So this says send a message to a randomly chosen connected agent. Okay. Um, connected means over the network. And I'm going to send the message that will say exposed. I, and now I put it in double quotes here. This is what's called a string. Okay. TA's um, Nona is alone up there helping people. I think we need more more help. There may be more of others who need help. Send to random connected here. Okay. Who needs help? How about online? Is anyone who's the Zoom master? Who's the Zoom master today? Are people needing help online? Good. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, just make that one. That's great. You got it. And for this one, I made it at a certain contact rate, say three per day, or one per day, or 12 per day, or 24 per day. We send, this person will send a message saying exposed to a random connected person. This is the information that sent to random connected needs to do its job. It's the message to send to a random neighbor of mine in the network, a random person connected with me in the network. Okay? Okay. So now we have people who are infected able to spread the message. We're just about done. But, and this relates to something 
that was said just a little bit ago by Rachel Thompson. If I run the model now, will infection be spreading? We have people who are infectious able to spread to susceptible. So if this person is in the state and they're exposing others, they're sending these messages, that message will be received by someone else. If that message is received by someone who's susceptible, that person will get infected and go to latent, to latent state. But will infection be spreading in the model right now? Why not? What's missing? Yeah, there's, there's no one who's infectious to spread, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, Rachel, you need someone to spark the outbreak. That's exactly it. It's precisely it. Couldn't have put it better. So we need someone who starts infectious. We need a seed person. Okay. Now, there's two ways to get this to happen. Two, or there's actually more than two. There's several ways to get this to happen. Um, I'm, I'm sorely torn by each of them. Um, I think I'll. I think because of that, I'll show you both. Okay. Um, I'll show you both of them here. Uh, so the first way is short and sweet. Well, I don't know how sweet it is. It's short. Okay. So the first one, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to Maine and I'm going to introduce to you. Each of them has learning value. I'm going to go to the palette and I'm going to put in an event, what's called an event. Now, an event, the job of an event is to, to, to schedule a, a kind of a sequence of happenings in the model, occurrences in the model. Events. It, it, it kicks off... Um, a series of times when things will happen. That's when an event does. I got it from the con from the agent palette. Okay, and it's going to be event. I'm going to say initial infection event. So when I have one of these events, I can say, look, does it occur um, at a certain rate? At a certain condition under a certain condition or with a certain timeout and does it occur cyclically or just once or under user control i'm going to make it a timeout and i'm going to have it occur only once later we'll be seeing reporting events that go off like every day or every week or every month these kind of epiphenomenal observer events that report on things but for now for now we're just going to have this go off at the initial time and the action here, it's going to undertake an action. That's why an event goes off. An event goes off to achieve, to, to uh, undertake some action, to perform some action. Later, we'll see it used for reporting, save information away, print information out. Here, there's one action that's needed. And Sob said it earlier, and Rachel mentioned it too. We want an initial person to be infected. This is going to go off the initial time and and we need them we need to infect an initial person. So at the initial time we are going to send to a person a message that says you're exposed and then we need them to 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 respond to it. They already have the ability. So I'm going to say deliver to random agent inside. And it's going to expose them to exposed. Wait, I have a question for you. Yeah. Third way to do it, to make it very specific to the population and say like, hey, population, send it to one of you. I think we could ask, we could ask for a random person from the population and send it to them. That would be easy to do. But yeah, I think that's what you have to do. Okay. Yeah, we could we could do it send to random agent inside. Another thing we could do would be to say um send. So this will be an alternative. We could say send population dot, and I think you can say population dot random. We could get 
Okay. Um, we could get a random person from the population and we could send them a message that basically says exposed, something like that. Um, wait, check my um, check my uh, my assertion here. Um, I think you could also do this. This would be another possibility. Um, uh, no, 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 no. Oh, you need, sorry, you need exposed before the agent. Um, so you need to do something like this. If you wanted to do it this way, you pick a random person from the population and you send them an exposed message. Maybe that's less opaque. Um, maybe it's more clear, you know, who I'm sending it to. Okay, so we're sending a message exposed to a person and that person is going to be susceptible. So what will happen when that person receives the message? Anyone? What's gonna happen? When that, whoever it is, receives that message, what's going to happen? When they receive the exposed message, what's going to happen here? They're in the exposed, the susceptible state, what's going to happen? Thinking mechanistically, what's going to happen? They're in this state, they get a message. Look at the diagram. They will, sorry? Yeah, they'll become infected. They'll go to the latent state. In some period of time after that, they'll become infective. And when they're infective, what's going to happen? They're going to be sending messages to neighbors, exposing them. Those will get them infected. Now, that person who sent them is going to continue on, but these neighbors will get infected. Should we try it? Should we try or not? Okay. Um, okay, so let's go run this. Let's go run it with the baseline. Here we go. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Um, now, in this one, do you see the infection here spreading? Do you see it on my screen spreading? Do you see that? Now, what would have happened if by chance, by happenstance, that initial person who got infected was this one here, or this one here, or this one here? What would have happened? It would have just fizzled out, right? It, it wouldn't have spread because they're not like, yes, it's possible. Yeah, so uh, Rachel, you can, there's several ways to do this. Um, you can comment uh, and there's there's several mechanisms for comment. You can also put notes on things. So Rachel just asked a wonderful question um, about putting notes and so on. And I'm gonna I'm gonna address that. So let's go back to Maine and here we have this initial event. So Rachel, you can put um, comments like this. Um, in fact, the initial person something like that that will be a comment you notice that it has these double slash not not backward slash not these no no this one um and it's it's colored green to indicate that it's a comment you can also put another way of doing it if you have multiple lines like if you have multiple lines here note that this um draws the person from um uh the population um i could do this but it gets a little bit sort of crufty because i'm putting these in the front of every line so an easier way to do that if you have multiple lines is you do this and then you do this at the end and that's a comment there um that's another form of comment um another thing you can do is uh, many any logic constructs have this field description, which can be used for metadata. So you can put this in the description down here and use it to kind of document the thinking behind what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. So actually, um, uh, I think the backslash backslash or sorry sl slash slash was first introduced for. The slash slash style was introduced with C++. It may have made its way back to C, 
but the um, slash uh, star and then star slash to end it is a C convention dating back to the early 70s. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so, so I will tell you one time um, I was working as a consultant with a set of uh, four MIT professors, and I was the one um, uh, accompanying them. I was a research associate um, at, at MIT shortly after this, and I was working with these professors as a consulting project at the time. And we um, we had a very high profile project for an overseas client on um, national government um, in Asia. And we were creating models uh, for them of um, matters of strategic security for them on the, uh, I'll just say, uh, water pump. It, it was involved water resources. And it was a matter of strategic concern. Um, so it was a must, must exceed project. So I was working with, you know, uh, top flight. Uh, research chairs in water engineering and construction and so on at MIT. And I was the modeler on the team. Um, we also had someone who specialized in risk analysis and an eminent professor of a uh, chair also in Sloan School on risk analysis, et cetera. And, and I was the one who <laughs> most of the work. Uh, and um, so I was building models um, of, for, for decision making for their for their uh, national posts. And uh, we were called before the board of a, um, actually the CEO of uh, one of the, the key um, organizations in that country. Uh, and he was a little bit skeptical of our modeling and he wanted to test how really rigorous it was. So he was very technical background. Um, uh, he was an engineer himself. And so he said, show me the model. So the professor looked at me, I, I, sort of show, uh, yeah, I called up the model. And he said, uh, what is this? What is that? Tell me what this is. And I explained it to him. And he was suitably impressed. And then he said, so where did you get this assumption? He pointed at a variable. I said, I went to the variable. I called it up. And just as Rachel had required for every variable, I had documentation on where it came from. This particular variable said, this value was provided in this data set sent to me on this date from this person in his organization. And he saw that and he, and he said, solid, no problem, um, go and do your work. So after the meeting, the professor said, like, you saved our butts. He said, they said, like, if you had been able to do that, I'm sure this would have been canceled, um, the, the project. Uh, he, he was so skeptical. But it was because it was self-documented. It was because it was rigorously um, described where these assumptions came from, what data they were based on. That was what secured his confidence. So this idea of having metadata mixed in with the model that documents the origin of certain assumptions, um, the uh, understanding that was placed into the model, the stakeholders who contribute to that understanding can be vital to build confidence in your model by certain stakeholders. Um, and uh, it was a lesson learned in my, in my youth. Okay. Um, Incidentally, the so we built these models and we used these models to evaluate a wide variety of scenarios. These were simulation models coupled with decision analysis. And we made a set, set of recommendations and they invested incredibly heavy and heavily in those recommendations. And every time I go to that country, I'm reminded uh, by the success of the project because their water infrastructure is centered around our recommendations from the year 2000. 
Um, and they've done extremely well because of them. They're far less vulnerable to geopolitical winds because of it. And uh, it gives gives me no shortage of uh, pleasure to know that that came out of our modeling. And it was uh, a fundamental decision that their country had to make. Anyway, um, okay, so we have this initial uh, infection event, and it's sent to a random person in the population. Let's go run it. So I, I run the model, and what should we see? Does anyone know? Well, um, what my point was, what we see will actually be a little bit different depending on where, who gets infected. It is possible it peters out. It's also possible it spreads. It depends on the happenstance of who is initially infected. And you'll notice that every time you rerun your model, you may get a very similar pattern. And I want to use this to, to uh, teach another lesson here. OK, um, so here we go. Um, so every time you notice it's the same person getting infected, it's like Groundhog Day, same person getting infected and it will be a similar similar spread uh, within the population. OK, so oh, I need to continue to run it. Here we go. Um, so one thing you might want to bear in mind is that right now, by default, in any logic, starting in like any logic seven, when you create a scenario, it's set to use what's called a fixed seed. And what that means is it's and it's entirely reproducible. It will always, in terms of the sequence of random chance events, so it will always have exactly the same sequence, as long as you don't modify the model. Same model, same assumptions for parameters. It will always have exactly the same random sequence. I told you, agent-based modeling has chance events, and these chance events will always be the same. That is sometimes a need. <laughs> It's good to have reproducibility, but we also, in general, we want to have a sense of variability. And so some of your scenarios, you'll use that with a fixed seed, perhaps, but some will use a random seed. And so in this randomness, we will, or in this randomness section of the scenario, often some of our scenarios, at least, and often most of them, will be done with a random seed. And when you run this, each time it will be different in happenstance. Each time it will be different in chance events, okay? Um, and, and so here we ran it, and it was a different initial person infected. Um, uh, I'll run it again, and it will be a different person yet uh, randomly infected, okay? Um, and what transpires depends a lot on you know, whether that initial person is in this connected component or one of these connected components further out, in which case it will have minor impact only. So this is a, matter, uh, a model of infectious disease. Um, OK, now um, we have limited time. I'm tempted, I promised I would show you two ways of infecting the original population. And I've shown you one. We have where we have an initial infection event that occurs from a random person in the population. I'd like to show you a different way. Can we do this? Yeah. So I'm gonna teach you another skill here. With this initial event, we can, when we have elements in any logic, sometimes not without entanglement, we can say, disable them by saying ignore. You notice when I say ignore, it turns it into this grayed out thing, which will basically mean it's inactive. Now you have to be a little bit careful because if there's other things referring to this, for example, it, it may cause trouble to ignore it. In this case, it's a standalone event and we can gray it out. We're gonna make do with another mechanism, okay? Um, and what we're going to do here, mm, 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 mm. right, 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 right. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit um, 
Okay, uh, we'll, we'll do the lightweight way. I'd like to do it more fully, but time is limited and we have to beat out the football players. Um, okay, so uh, let me show you another way to do this, which, which is very widespread and it's neat. So, um, oh, I'm gonna post this. This will be version two and anyone who wants to grab it can do so, okay? Um, and uh, we will go and, hey, there we are. Okay, it is posted now, if anyone wants it. Good. Okay, suppose we wanted a certain fraction of the population to start already infective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we can do this in uh, a couple of ways. Right. Um, so, so I'm going to have this infection state chart come in and we're going to have a certain fraction that starts susceptible, or a certain fraction start infective, the others will start susceptible, okay? And we're gonna have a population in Maine, I'm uh, sorry, parameter in Maine, excuse me, a parameter in Maine. Probably I, I shouldn't have just, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm doing things a little bit out of order. In Maine, let's add a parameter that called um, uh, initial, fraction infectious or infective. And it's going to be uh, one, it'll be 5% of the population. Say 1% of the population, so 0 0.01. Some people might prefer initial proportion uh, infective. I think that's more common in the health sciences talk about proportions. Um, so I'll call it proportion, okay? Proportion, that's fine. Proportion. There we go. Okay. Great. Okay, let's go back to person. And we're going to take the infection state chart. And when people come in, that fraction of them will start infective. And so on average, someone will start infective that fraction of the time, otherwise they'll start susceptible. Um, and it'll be, it'll be chance where they start, so a given person. So we just drag this up, and now I'm gonna drag in a branch event. We haven't seen this yet. Wait, it blinked. Yeah, I've seen that. Thank you. So with this uh, event, or, or with, when they come in, we're gonna roll the dice. And with a certain probability, they will go, uh, excuse me, they will go to the infective state. Otherwise they will go to, I'm sorry, this, this should actually be to there. And otherwise they will go to, to the infective state down here. Okay. And I'm gonna double click on this and drag it up here. There we go. Drag it up here. There we go. That's it. Just like that, ladies and gentlemen. And so I've, I've gotten two links from this. So this thing has to link up to this. This is a branch. It's gonna roll a dice. It's gonna flip a coin. Either we go this way or we go this way, okay? This one is gonna be the so-called conditional transition from the branch to infective, okay? The other will be the default if the condition is not true. And the condition will be here, we're gonna flip a coin. This is kind of the poor person's way of doing this. There's actually a much more general way to, to route them among all the states, but uh, we don't have the, we don't have the um, time to, to do that right now and still beat the football players to their game. Okay, so, so for the condition here, we're gonna flip a coin. Can I show you how to flip a coin in any logic? Hearing no objections? 
we're going to say random true. So basically that means with a certain probability, give me true, otherwise false. So, so give me back true with a certain probability. And what is that probability? Guess what? What's the probability they go to infected? It's what we put in main, right? Initial proportion infective. Mm -hmm. Okay, TAs, uh, Nona serves alone. And, and I'm hoping others can serve. Who else needs help? How about online? How are we doing online? Jenna, Jenna is away from the battle station. Could someone else check the online environment? All good? Okay, all good? Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is random truth. So a certain fraction, so this is flipping a coin. It's saying, hey, return a value that's true with this probability and otherwise is false. Okay. And so this is a parameter name called the initial population of proportion infected. And it's, it's uh, what do we say? Zero, uh, we said 1%, something like that. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, initial proportion infected is 0 0.01. Okay. Um, okay. Are we ready? Let's build it. Boom. So now, instead of sending a message to someone up front, we are starting with a certain population fraction effect. If I had 10 more minutes, I would have shown you a very beautiful general mechanism um, uh, that would have divided people up among all these stocks with a certain probability distribution you could specify you could specify crisply and it would be illustrated to you. So um, if anyone wants to see that over lunch or after lunch, I'm glad to show that. But here we just flip a coin, a certain fraction start here, otherwise they're susceptible. That's kind of the poor person's version. Let's run it. Let's run it. So 1% of the population start infective and on average, it's, it's they're flipping, each person is flipping a coin. So here, you know, these three people started, and okay, okay, actually, sorry, I saw two there. There's some out here started infective, there's some out here, and the infection proceeds forthwith, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, great, great. Yes. Okay. 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 Great. 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 Um, that we're 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 in a countdown with the football players. So we gotta we we're gonna do one or two more things here before lunch. Okay. Um, great. 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 Um. Mm, 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 okay. Um. Right, 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 right. Okay. Um, uh, and we're going to go, I think what we'll do is uh, we will put in place a uh, histogram. Uh, yeah, time is time is short. This is going to be a little bit a little bit tricky. Um, I think I think we'll go ahead and and uh, do it. Um, do 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 right. Um, okay. Um, right. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to put in place a statistic for two things. One, uh, we're going to calculate a proportion of people who are low income that are infective versus a proportion of non-low-income people that are infected. So I'm going to add 
from the palette a, a parameter that's going to be, um, we're going to call it um, uh, low, low um, uh, income threshold, okay? Um, and we'll, we'll make it its value for this model a uh, uh, 100 here, okay? Um, now, if we'd been more careful, if I'd been more careful about designing the, the distribution, we could have made this a more realistic level, but we'll, we'll put that in place now. Um, okay. Uh, so if someone is an income below that, we'll count them as low income. Otherwise, they'll be deemed as not low income. Okay, great. Okay, we're in a countdown. Um, so we put in a low income threshold into Maine. And uh, probably I should have posted this. Does anyone want me to post this online right now? Or can I complete the thought? Anyone wanted me to post? Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, low income threshold, it's in Maine. Let's go to, now let's go to, where do we compute statistics? Can anyone remember from yesterday? Where do we compute statistics? In the one, begins with P. And it, uh, that's, it, it has nothing to do with persons. And where is it? It's in the pop, 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 population, okay. Population, yeah. Um, good, good, good. Um, okay, so we go to population and we have statistics. Let's go to the statistics and we're going to add to the statistics here. Are you ready? Okay, okay. We're, we're in a sprint towards lunch like those football players, okay? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna beat them there. Um, beat them at their own game, okay? Uh, okay. Um, great. So we're going to name the statistic, um, uh, prevalence, uh, uh, yeah, um, maybe we'll just say prevalence because we're only dealing with one infection. And do, does anyone remember how to do a prevalence? Is it a sum, a count, a max, a min, or an average? Average indeed. Okay. And and specifically, um, maybe maybe we'll say prevalence of infectiousness um, because it will be specifically prevalence of of being infectious. Yeah, um, we're, we won't count latent people uh, right now. Okay, it'll be an average, and we're gonna say. Remember, it, this is it's gonna give a little expression that we can tell what what subset of the population do we want we're going to specify condition here we have no condition it'll be the, over the entire population it's going to compute this average and what is the average it's going to compute well we call each person item in turn so item is the name of the person we're going to say are they in state person dot remember that autocomplete is your friend person dot infective if they are in the state What's the value over which we're taking the average? If they are in that state, the value is what? It's one of the most important numbers there is, arguably the most important number. It's the unit of the monoid of the of the multiplicative monoid um, in, <laughs> in in real numbers. Okay, that doesn't help for most. Okay, it's it's one point zero. Otherwise, it's zero point zero. Uh, um. Some some almadius like that. Okay, um, so so this means if they're infective, we'll count them as one. Otherwise, we'll count them as zero. So if there's five people who are infectious, infective, there'll be five ones. And if there's five people not infectious, we put zeros. The average will be 0. 0.5, which is the fraction of them that are that are infectious. Okay, great. Okay, that's prevalence of infectious. Um, um, yeah, um, fine. And then we'll say prevalence of infectious amongst, we, we created another one, prevalence of infection amongst low SES. How's that? Low SES, um, among low income. I'll say low income because um, it's going to be an average. It's going to be the same formula exactly, 
but who's for who is it could be restricted to? We only want the average over people that are what? Low income indeed. How do we determine if they're low income? Well, each one is called item. So we say if item dot in in in, in income, thank you. If it's less than low income threshold, um, that's how we tell if they're eligible to be included in this, in this count, this average. We're only including it over people whose income is beneath that. Maybe we'll do it less than or equal to it, okay? That's what that looks like. Okay? And then we have one final one more that's just among among non low income, um, among among uh, among uh, I'll just say medium and high income, and it'll be average, and it's same same thing the same rule it's the same way of computing the average. But it's only going to be it's going to be restricted to only be taken for those who are above the income threshold, and that's it. And Bob's your uncle. Okay. So so are you are you? Um, so those are the three rules. The first of the rule lays down the basic basic mechanism to take an average, taking an average um, uh, by someone's infected status. Basically, this is going to be the fraction of people who are infected in the whole population. That's why conditional is empty. Um, condition is empty. It's over the entire, there's no restriction on the population. The second one is restricted for those who are low income, and we're taking the average of their, of their infection status. One for infected, zero. Otherwise, we'll get the fraction that are infected. The third one is just the flip of this, where we're, we're restricting it to only the average of, of uh, we're only taking the proportion of them that are, are um, infectious among those who are, whose income is above the low income threshold. And make sure that this builds and, and oops, hey, get over there. Um, make sure it builds. Oh my gosh, I got rid of the projects. Okay, here we go. Boom. Hey, oh my gosh. Oh, here it is. It, it collapsed up here. Um, okay. Oh, that's fun. That's that's intro. That's wild. I don't know. Okay, here we go. Boom. There we go. Okay. Great. So now let's run it. Let's run it. Eh? And and let's get you running to the cafeteria to beat the Football players. Um, okay, so if you click on the population here, you'll notice that it gives those proportions. Prevalence of infection overall is about 2%. It's, it's climbing, but population, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That's interesting. I didn't expect that. Maybe by chance. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's uh, it's higher amongst, I'm, I'm running it out, among low income, it's like, 20, 20 something percent right now. That's over double what it is for medium and high income. Um, and uh, it seemed, but now they're recovering in the low income, but it's still higher than what it is in, in high income and so on. And we could plot these out on a nice plot like we did yesterday, but even better than a nice plot is a full belly. So um, I'm going to save this. I'm going to post it. And why don't you? Get ye to the uh, cafeteria before the football players Trump um, sort of uh, stampede in. Okay? And I'll watch the room. I'll hold out. And I'll make sure the doors are locked in case any of the football players, players come here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the vouchers are, are, are up here. Um, uh, so today, so that's the hackathon. Today is the 23rd. It's this top, top one. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There. I was making him Yeah. Because that I think Sure. That's great. That's, yeah, absolutely. That's excellent. Yeah. That's kind of what I had in mind. Thanks.
So uh, just one moment. I just want to stop the uh, the uh, recording here and uh, stop the. Um, the question. Yeah. Uh, after two p.m. Uh, uh -huh. 